This is David Tarkington, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Orange Park, Florida. Thank you for downloading this sermon. For any other information or questions you may have, please go to firstfam.org or give us a call at 904-264-2351. Amen. While you're standing, if you can grab a copy of God's Word. We're going to be in Acts chapter 18. I was having my wife and I and uh, John and Monica Green, we were having dinner last night, and Blake was with us, a member of our church, and as we left, I said, hey, I'll see you tomorrow. He may even be in the room. I'm not, I'm not seeing anyone in here. Where is he? There he is. I said, hey, Blake, I'll see you tomorrow. He looked at me, because that's that trick question. I learned it from Wendy's. I went to Wendy's once and bought a hamburger, and when I left, they said, see you tomorrow. It made me feel guilty for not going the next day and buying another hamburger. So I said, see you tomorrow. And Blake said, hey, are we still in the book of Acts? To which I laughed and said, we're in the 62nd sermon in the book of Acts. And at this rate, we're going to stay in Acts for a little while longer. So we're in Acts chapter 18. Chapter 18, if you have a copy of God's Word with you, you can follow along. It'll be on the screen here as well as online. We're in verse 18. It says, After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Centrae, I said that so much better at 8 o'clock, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills, and he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Some of you, I've said this before, but you catch, I grew up in the Baptist church. I heard a lot of sermons as a kid growing up. Never did I hear the name Caesarea pronounced Caesarea. It was always Caesarea. It sounded so much more intellectual, right? Until I traveled to Israel and numerous trips there in Israel and our friend Yoni and those that live there actually told me the name of the city is Caesarea. That's how everybody that lives here pronounces it. And then I just kind of figured out that if you live somewhere and that's what it is, they probably know how to say the name. So that's why I say Caesarea. You ever met anybody who doesn't pronounce their last name correctly? (laughs) Right? Right? Yeah. So I mean, that's you look at it, you go, that's not how you say that. And they go, well, it's my name. That's how I say it. You know, I've been telling Neil and Katie Jimenez that it's Jimenez all this time. They said, no, it's Jimenez. I asked Neil about that. Neil and Katie, they serve as missionaries, church planters up in Toronto. They grew up here. And I said, I asked Neil, I said, how come when I was in Texas, the restaurant was Jimenez, but your name is Jimenez? He said, because my dad quit trying to correct everybody and just gave up and said, we're Jimenez. So I said, all right, that works for me. So sometimes you just need to, to know the context and how to say the names, and I try my best with these Bible names, but that one, I, I know that's how they say it right there in the city itself. There are, uh, as we look at this, there are phrases, there are words, there are things said by Christians and in churches, and by people like us and in churches like ours over the years that while not necessarily untrue, in fact, they are true, what they end up eventually sounding like empty cliches. Religious cliches, empty phrases, they become the Christianese versions of those positive thinking posters you see hanging up in offices. I don't know if you've ever seen those. You know, you got the skydivers, and they're all holding hands, and it says teamwork, and it has something to motivate you to work together as a team. Uh, you know, those posters are everywhere. And if you add a Bible verse to it, then it becomes a Christian version of positive thinking. There's really nothing wrong with that. It just, I'm not quite sure that I've ever been motivated by a poster to hang in there or to work well together. And yet sometimes in Christian life, we, we are, well, let's just be honest. Our depth of understanding the word sometimes isn't deep enough to do much more than offer people a verse a day to keep the devil away. And while that may or may not work, sometimes I think as, as children of God, as Christians, we need to make sure that we're studying the word of God and not living vicariously by someone else who wrote a devotional. That we go in, we dig in, and we understand that life is hard. See, so, so there are times in life when we are intent on motivating ourselves or others to just press on and move forward, that what we do as Christians, we borrow from the culture, and we add a verse to it, and we Christianize things, and we, we offer help that is little more than religious therapeutic mantras. And when the going gets rough, 
They end up being little more than phrases laced with just enough Jesus to make us think they're actually helpful, but there's not much there. So we say, let go and let God, which isn't necessarily sinful or wrong. It's just been said so much on so many occasions that we're not quite sure it means anything. Let go and let God. And we also remember at some point during the going gets rough that we're just supposed to remember that Jesus is carrying us on that beach. That's why there's only one set of footprints. Not nearly in the Bible. Makes for a nice picture in the living room, I guess. It's not bad. It's not sinful. It's supposed to be motivational. But it's also a reminder that sometimes we just try to tell each other as believers, as brothers and sisters, to just, you know, if we just pick ourselves up with our own strength, if we just tell ourselves that we're trusting in the strength of the Lord, that we'll be good, we'll get through it. But actually what we're doing is we're just repeating phrases while looking in the mirror because somewhere deep inside we have been convinced that as Christians, and I don't know that we, we, we would say that we believe this, but there's this subconscious thing that works out, that the way Christianity is marketed in America, that the way the feel-good Jesus movement kind of gives, gives that, that message out there in a very shallow way, that often even as believers who are sincerely seeking to live for the Lord, we convince ourselves, unfortunately, that Christians are not supposed to feel tired that we're not supposed to feel beaten up or beaten down, depending on your perspective, that we're not supposed to feel despair, and we're never to have any kind of thoughts of uncertainty go through our brains. But the fact of the matter is, we do. We do. And then sometimes when we feel that way, we feel guilty. Because there is an accuser that works against us to accuse the brethren and when we feel guilty because we actually have feelings, we wonder if that means we're really bad Christians. And sometimes, maybe we are really bad Christians. I'm not discounting that some of us are really bad Christians, but nonetheless, not because of that. And sometimes we feel maybe that, well, if I feel that way, maybe I'm not even a Christian at all. And so what's sold to the American public and to the American religious public, and I'm talking about the American public because that is exactly where I live, so I'm talking about us I know it's global, but there is this therapeutic mantra with Bible verses added to it that is intent on just getting us through the day. And if we don't have a verse, maybe we just hold on to the latest repeatable and singable pop ballad that made it in the top 40 Christian hits on the radio. Because it feels good. Now, is there anything wrong with any of that? No, not really. But I will tell you this, it's never enough. It is not something you can use instead of God. Because it tends to be, if I can just repeat this verse, if I can just sing this song, if I can just change the way I think, then everything will be better. But you've also, if you've not caught what's happening, you're putting everything on I. All I need to do is give up. Surrender. Thus, a common version of how we move forward in life is offered, and it may not be, as I said, totally wrong, but it sure seems superficial and tends to put the onus on us to fix ourselves. Because ultimately, we're okay. We can do it. We can just pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and be better versions of ourselves. Or at least we're going to fake it till we make it. All the while, we just keep talking the talk while trying to walk the walk, but desiring really to sit the sit so we can rest the rest and let someone else do what needs to be done. Because I don't know if you've noticed, it's hard to live the faithful Christian life. If you're not facing pressures from without, you're gonna face them from within. And in the world where the pandemic is now normal, for everyone wanting to get back to normal, here's uh, some bad news. Pandemic presence is normal. Now the question is, how are we going to move through this? Not how do we get out from under it? Are we gonna trust the Lord in this midst just like we did prior? You know, we, we, we used to have these little mantras we would throw out to men's groups and others and say, you know what, it's the message. You have what it takes was the message offered. If you just believe you have what it takes, if your daddy had been a better daddy, you'd be a better person, you know, that kind of thing. But here's what the Word of God says. Hate to reveal this to you, but you don't have what it takes. And I don't either. I don't have what it takes to be a better version of me. 
apart from God and apart from Christ within me, transforming me from the inside out, making me into somebody I can't be on my own, I don't have what it takes. Every self-confident individual in the room that is always in their own mind, the smartest guy in the room, the one, the smartest woman in the room, the one who, you know, uh, sometimes we're just uh, emotional and spiritual bullies. We bully everybody else so we feel better about ourselves. The fact of the matter is, none of us are doing this that great, and we don't have what it takes, but thanks be to God, he does. And if we would just surrender to him, if we would trust in him in these moments, I believe we would see a great renewal and revival take place within the church right now in the worst time of my living history, and maybe for yours as well. You know, I grew up in church life with church words, things that were said. I grew up in an era where revival services took place, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we'd meet from Monday through Friday, and we would have these moments. And then there was a word. There was something that was kind of in the 60s, 70s, 80s, kind of became a, a nomenclature in church life. But at the end of the service, there was that call to a decision. Become a Christian. We'll sing just as I am, all 75 verses of it, until you come. And you're going to come. You're going to make a decision. We, local churches copied Billy Graham's crusades, thinking they could replicate what took place in a stadium in their own buildings. And so we built this, this system, this machinery, not necessarily bad, as I said, because God redeemed people through that. But we added a word to the language, to the lexicon. It was a word that I thought was normative, and I thought it was biblical. It was a word I heard at every youth camp that I was speaking at or that I was, that I was attending. It was a word I heard at every, maybe disciple now, and, and every youth event, and kids event, and revival service. And it was that for those who are lost, you need to come forward and get saved. And for those who are saved, but you're living sorry lives, you need to rededicate your life. Rededicate. I just come in, Why are you coming forward today, sir? I'm here to rededicate my life. That's great. That's wonderful. For decades, rededication, rededication, rededicate. We're counting rededications. Now, some of you are going to get a little mad that I'm debunking that, but that word's not a scriptural word. Why are you rededicating your life? The only reason a Christian, redeemed by the blood, name written in the book of life, not going to miss heaven, should have to rededicate his or her life is because at some point they stop walking with the Lord on a daily basis, sin has entered in, and they don't need to make another promise. They need to make a confession and say, I repent of the sin that has kept me from being who I need to be. We do this. We take words that are offensive or a little bit, oh, I don't know if I like the way that sounds, and we soften them. You know, back in the 40s and 50s, you would talk about people who are doing things unethically with others that are not married to themselves as, or to, to them as, uh, as committing adultery. There's a good Bible word. We don't like using that much, you know, fornication, adultery, adultery. Some of you are Googling it even now. But somewhere along the 50s and the advent of Peyton Place and soap operas and As the World Turns and, oh my gosh, Victor and Nikki and all that and Young and the Restless, here's what happened. Everybody here knows what I'm talking about, you know? Okay, that just means, that, you know what that means? That means you grew up in a household where your preacher preached against soap operas, but your parents called them stories, so you watched them anyway. <laughs> and every kid that had to stay home during the summer, you did what I had to do when you weren't outside, right? It's either Price is Right, then you got the, there they go. Young and the restless, bold and beautiful, as the world turns, guiding light, now go play with your friends. It's amazing. I'm not saying I watch those, but I can tell you, you don't have to watch every episode. You can watch one episode every eight years and be totally caught up. But nonetheless, <laughs> here's what happened. Words matter. Adultery, the sin of a relationship outside of marriage with another, turned into having an affair. It's just a little softer. It's not as offensive. Just having an affair. And then it turned into an extramarital relationship. It's still adultery, but the eh. I don't want to use that word. So somewhere along the line, the word repentance became rededication because it didn't sound as offensive. Rededication is, I'm just going to make another promise. Repentance means I'm on my knees confessing my sin. I'm so sorry, God, that I've strayed, that I am not honoring you. Words matter. I don't like it when words matter. You don't either, but they do matter. And this is what we must know to be true that we need a moment of recognition, a moment of repentance, a moment of reconciliation, a moment of renewal in Christ alone. We need to abandon therapeutic American versions of Christianity that are little more than desiring God to be some psychoanalyst that will ask us how we're feeling and how that's working out for us. To go to the Word of God and to live within that truth that has been offered to us rather than settling for a self-actualized religion 
That is not the real thing. Now, some of you know who John Wesley is. John Wesley and Charles Wesley, they were godly men. They did much work in the church. They, their parents were godly parents. Their mother was, her, her prayer life is one of those, you read the biography and you realize, man, this lady, every, every woman, every man should, have, should aspire to be focused in prayer like their mother was. She had, they had a number of children, and, and, and the word is in, in the biography is that when there was nowhere to get away from the kids, you know, it's one of those households, that she would pull her apron up over her head. And if the kids saw mom with the apron over their head, she's having a time alone with God, maybe praying about them. So leave mama alone. But they were raised, John and Charles, in a godly family. I'm going to talk more about this next week, but I want to just allude to it now. You may not be aware of who the Wesleys were, but they were instrumental in, their, in the movement of Christian church and denominationalism that came to be known as Wesleyanism. Go figure but also Methodism. So the United Methodist Church, all the Methodist denominations come out of that John Wesley and Charles Wesley movement of methodical worship. That's where that means. Even the Salvation Army is a Wesleyan denomination. So the Wesleys were godly men, but look at this. In his own journal, John Wesley writes in 1738, he declares his desire and work for the Lord as pastor, preacher, and missionary. I don't know how many of you like to tour little areas around the region, but if you've ever been up to Jekyll Island or St. Simon's Island you, in Georgia, you probably have recognized that that was an area the Wesleys actually came to, where they served, where John did. But he reveals that he was a failure as a missionary, as a missionary in Georgia, what is now the state of Georgia, and that it crushed him because he was un, not, not, not really successful in the world's eyes in the work he was doing. He ended up going back to England. He studied at Oxford, was in a club of other Christians, and we're all about parachurch clubs and church groups. At Oxford, they called themselves the Holy Club, a little, maybe a little self-righteous on the naming, but nonetheless, the Holy Club. His parents were godly men and, man and woman. They, they served the Lord faithfully, raised their children to serve the Lord and love the Lord. But here's something that he writes in his diary, in his journal. A seemingly random encounter took place after the missionary work, after the Holy Club leadership, where he really became a Christian. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting that you can do church work and do missionary work and not know the Lord. He didn't realize that at the time. We'll talk more about that next week as we talk about a man named Apollos who was doing the very same thing, and God redeemed him. But today I want to look at Paul. I was originally going to do the whole scripture all the way to the end of chapter 18, but I thought, no, let's just look at this one section today because there's something here, I believe, that if we rush through it to get to the story of Apollos, we're going to miss what Paul is doing here, what God is teaching us through this moment. This moment between verses 18 and 23 are transitional in, Paul, in the Apostle Paul's life. Paul, called by God, equipped by God, and sent by his church on mission. This is the second missionary journey. I'm not certain Paul knew it was his second missionary journey. I'm not sure. I'm, I know he knew it was the second journey. I don't know if he knew it was completely coming to an end, that it would be labeled as such. But I do know that, that the work that he was doing, as I'm reading this, I am re realizing the reality that Paul was on mission for the Lord, serving him faithfully, and there was absolutely nothing he was doing that was easy. Nothing easy. Traveling wasn't easy. Reception from the people was definitely not easy. He did not have the celebrity touring pastor route routine down to where it was a, a fun time had by all, but it was worthwhile. What fueled Paul was this, not a self-focused, positivity-laden, holy, mantra-repeating, therapeutic version of Christianity. No, what was fueling him was that he had been transformed by the Holy Spirit of God, called out to serve and to go on mission for the sake of the gospel. He had been sent by the church. He had been commissioned by God, and none of this was easy, and yet he persisted. I confess that I like comfort a lot more than I should. I like easy. I want an easy button for everything. I don't like it when it gets hard. Now, maybe that's just me. Maybe some of you out there are kind of masochistic. You like it when it's difficult. But I don't. And I look at what Paul went through, and I'm like, man, to read about the first missionary journey makes you really think about why in the world would he do another one and then another one? Because they don't get easier. And if you know how it ends, it doesn't end well. Well, it does, eternally speaking. But death in Rome wasn't necessarily what he was looking for. But he persisted. 
He was a man continually working through this transition on mission. And in this closing portion of the second journey, we're reminded of values that Paul held. Paul had to hold on to some values. And as I look at these values, I'm reminded of the values that we as a church have stated clearly. This is who we are as a church. This is non-negotiable. These are the things we value at First Baptist Orange Park. And they echo what was valuable in Paul's life and what was valuable in every obedient apostle and follower of God throughout history. First thing we notice is that Paul loved God. I mean, I know that sounds simple. As a church, we ought to love God, but this is, this is like the real love right here. This is what it means. This is all in. Look what it says in verse 18. After this section of the trip he was on, it said, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. Those two are major players in the book of Acts. They're going to come back later. But then it says that Sincrae, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. Now, let me just say it's a short transitional verse. But there's a whole lot happening right here. And here's the question I have. Maybe you had this. In the holy, inerrant, immutable, timeless word of God, why do we care he got a haircut? Think about it. There's a whole lot going on in the world, but there's enough there that the Holy Spirit gave to Luke to write down, to put pen to paper to say, and at this city, he got a haircut. And you have to read that and go, is that that big a deal? Now, here's what he's not doing. He's not getting his hair styled. He's not getting a blowout so that he can go on stage and look good. He's not getting set up for this new Instagram pose. He's not having a makeover that includes new clothes, first century version of Botox or veneers, and the latest accoutrements to make Paul the cool celebrity pastor. That's only happening in the 21st century church. I said it. You can rewind it and hear me say it again if you want. Paul's love for God should never be questioned. Even prior to the point where Paul became a Christian, he loved God. He loved God and was doing things that we say were deplorable, like arresting Christians and trying to shut down churches. But he only did that because he loved God and he was misinformed. He didn't know that he was doing the wrong thing. I'm not excusing his sin. I'm just saying that it is definitely easy to figure out that all that Paul was doing pre-Christian conversion and post-Christian conversion, he was doing because in his mind and in his heart, he was doing it because he loved God. God just met him on the road to Damascus and saying, you're missing this. You, can, you think you're doing this for me. You're doing this against me. And that probably broke his heart more than we can imagine. But Paul's love for God should never be questioned. This man's heart was focused on God and he sought to honor him in obedience to Christ's command, and the echo of what the Old Testament says in the Shema, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, might, and strength. Paul sets sail from Corinth and begins his closing chapter of the journey. Priscilla and Aquila are there with him, and they become major points, as I said, near future. But here we see that in this city, Sincrae, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. Why? Let me, let me take you back to the Old Testament and let me tell you what's going on. Numbers chapter 6. It says, chapter 6, verse 1, says, the Lord spoke to Moses. So now we're going all the way back to the Old Testament. Moses is still alive. The law has been given to him. God is speaking to him. Verse 2, it says, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when either a man or a woman makes a special vow, a vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink and shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes, fresh or dried. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head until the time it is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. He shall let the locks of his hair, of his head, grow long. Now, there's a whole lot of what in the world right there as you read that. And there's a whole lot of, you know, modern day Christians that really don't like the details, but God is a God of details. And you're going, you ever, you ever find yourself looking at stuff the church does or, or, or the Bible says, is that really that big a deal? Is that really that big a deal? We got to do this, that, and the other. Is it a big deal the way we do the Lord's Supper? Why can't we just do it with, you know, uh, knee-high grape juice and tortilla chips? You know, why can't we do it? Is it a big deal we do it the way the Bible says? God is a God of detail. He's a God of order. He's a God that doesn't ask for a uh, vote, but he gives commands. And while this is in the Old Testament, this is in the Torah, this is in the law, here's what we have here. You have an in, a part of what's called the Nazarite vow. And I didn't give all of it here. You can read the rest of number six if you choose to. But the Nazarite vow is an interesting thing. It's not a Nazarene, it's a Nazarite. The Nazarite vow, it is this, a voluntary action by a man or a woman seeking to honor God. 
It comes from the Hebrew root word, natzir, which simply means to consecrate oneself and separate oneself in service to the Lord. It's generally done by a man or a woman, individually, by choice. Not mandated by the preacher, not said by the leader, hey, we're all going to take a Nazarite vow. It says God within an individual calls an individual to consecrate themselves to the work the Lord has done, is going to do in them. And there are only two occasions that we see in Scripture where the vow was uh, placed upon someone who didn't really have a choice, and that's in the birth of Samson and in John the Baptist. But otherwise, you have this Nazarite vow happening, and here's what's going on. Paul, being a Jew by birth and a faithful student of the Torah, of the law, of the Old Testament, he was always seeking ways to honor God. And apparently, he, by choice, somewhere along the line on the second journey, with all the difficulty that was upon him, all the pressure, all the people trying to kill him, all the people not listening to him, he felt led to consecrate himself and made a vow. That would have an ending date. And in the, as testimony of his vow, he would not cut his hair. It's not one of those things where everybody, he's doing it for public recognition. It's kind of like when the Bible says if you're fasting, you don't need to post online that you're fasting. If you're fasting for spiritual reasons, not because you have surgery coming up, but for spiritual reasons, you're supposed to keep it a secret. You're supposed to act like you're not miserable because you're hungry all the time. And you're supposed to spend that time in prayer. Well, the same is true with the Nazarite vow. I guess you're supposed to pull your hair back and it looked least like he combed it. But he shares this. He shares, this is his vow. He shares a parallel to this vow for all believers. Later in a letter to the Roman church, he's not requiring the haircut or the sacrifice because what would happen, you'd cut the hair and then you would burn the hair as a sacrifice to the Lord. That's not necessary. But look here in Romans 12, Paul writes, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Hey, you feel like God is calling you to do some work for him? Consecrate yourself to him and quit uh, and, and give your life over to him, even as believers, a repentance of sin and a renewal of your walk. It confuses some, however, when you read of Paul's haircut. But don't get lost in the weeds on this and get confused over Paul's Jewish heritage, which he never let go of, and his newfound Christianity that he found in Christ through the good news. The faithful apostle loved the Lord with all his heart, soul, might, and strength, and was focusing daily on the calling God had given him. His growing hair reminded him, if you can imagine, that every day he's running his fingers through whatever's left on his head, he is reminded of his vow to the Lord. He is reminded that today I will live for the Lord. It's more than a verse a day for my daily devotion. It's a reminder of a promise I made to which Ecclesiastes says, if you're going to make a vow, you better, you better keep it. Don't make vows and break them. I remind, I remind couples of that at every wedding I do. It's a big deal to make a vow and break it. Because your vow is not just to a person, it's to the Lord himself. So that hair is a reminder of his vow. But what happened in Sincrae? He got his hair cut. He shaved his head with intent to go to Jerusalem immediately as soon as he got back on the ship and made his way over to the the coast. Why is that a big deal? Well, a long-haired Paul in a Gentile city is no big deal because most of the Gentiles in Corinth and Ephesus and these places, they don't know anything about Nazarite vows. Maybe some of the Jews would that they're in the synagogue, but not the majority of the people. But when he makes his way in the city of Jerusalem, everybody will see his long hair and they will go, now we're not going to listen to you talk about the gospel because we want to talk about your vow. Or we want to think, who do you think you are? You ever, you, you, that kind of goes. You think you're better than us? You made a vow? So he cut his hair for two reasons. I believe one reason is because he's heading back into Jerusalem. The second reason is because the time of the vow was over. It was complete. Paul's action was an expression of God's protection over him throughout the journey. That's why he made the vow. God protected him. And it showed that he never disregarded the rever- relevance of the law, though he knew the law was made fulfilled and complete in Christ himself. And in Jerusalem, now that that's on his itinerary, here's what John Stott says in a commentary about that. He states, perhaps on this occasion, in order to conciliate the Jewish Christian leaders that he was going to see in Jerusalem, he cut his hair so there'd be no distractions. So Paul loved God so much that his life reflected it in everyday choices that he made. Second thing, 
is that Paul loved people. And apparently he loved all people. If you look at the passage in verse 19, it says he came to Ephesus and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Now we know that last week we talked about being in Corinth where he went to the synagogue, he talked to the Jewish people, they did not respond and he said, blood is on your hand, I'm going to the Gentiles now. That was for those specific Jews that happened to be in that specific city, but that did not mean that he abandoned reaching his people, his culture, his people who grew up Jewish just like he did with the message of the gospel and as he did in Ephesus. It continues on, it says, when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave, he said, I'll return to you if if God wills it. And he set sail from Ephesus. The great commandment is not up for a vote either. Jesus said that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Love God, love people. Which people? All people. People I don't like, that's all people. People that speak a different language, all people. People with a different skin tone, all people. People that grew up Muslim, all people. People that are atheist, all people. Who are we to love? All people. Paul went into places that hated him. But because he loved them so dearly, he continued to go. And he went to the Jews that rejected him. Because he loved them, he had a burden for them. And it says that he stopped in Ephesus. And I don't know if you remember this, but there was a couple of chapters back where Paul tried to go to Ephesus and God said no, and the Macedonian call came and he went to Macedonia. But now God's opening the door and says, okay, now you can go. So now he's spending time in Ephesus. It's interesting that God has done this. And when he leaves, he says, I'll be back if it be God's will. I don't write the story. I don't write the map. God decides where I need to be. Paul loved people because people matter. Lost people matter. Loved ones matter. And time, I don't know if you realize this, but nowadays it's becoming more and more clear. Time is short. I've got a funeral today at 3 o'clock. Had one yesterday at 10. Had a graveside service last Wednesday. Got another one coming up next week. Got another graveside the week after that. And who knows what's coming next, but here's what I know about funerals. I am honored and blessed to be able to preach funeral services for family members. It, it, it wears on you, but it is a celebration. I'll just tell you that. But, but, but not every funeral is a celebration, just so you know. But every time I preach at a funeral, I, we share stories about the deceased, the loved one. We try to laugh a little bit as we remember together and well. And, but I always talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I always, I mean, it's not, I say, hey, here's the deal. Heaven is real, and the Bible says funerals are good places to go every now and then because it ought to wake you up to realize this is what life's all about. And every time I'm preaching at a funeral, here's what I know. I got a whole bunch of people in the room, depending on who the deceased is. I got a whole lot of people listening that are going to hear the gospel, some for the very first time, some maybe for the very last time. But they're going to hear it. Why would I waste my time telling people that Jesus is the answer? Because I love all people, and I have to. And if we don't tell them, it's like, I mean, can you imagine someone actually, I mean, the real deal, don't get into politics, don't start debating, and please don't text or email me, but just imagine, if you would, that there, someone had the real deal, 100% immediate cure for COVID, and they gave it to no one. What would you think about that person? Here's what I've got. Here's what you've got, Christian. You've got the number one, 100% accurate, no fails, fail-safe cure for death. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Eternal life is offered if you would but surrender. We have it. But if we don't tell anybody, we're as evil as the individual that might have the cure for COVID and keeps it to himself. When I preach at funerals, here's what I know. There's a whole lot of people that are hearing the gospel and have a chance to say yes. But there's always one in the room that can't. And they're usually in the box right before me. Because at that juncture, it's too late for that individual. Thanks be to God that for all the funerals I've done most recently, that individual made that decision many years prior. So we can grieve, but not as those without hope. Paul cared enough to go to the hard places to tell the truth to people that didn't want to hear it. Because he knew it was the only answer they had. Now I'm running out of time, so let me quickly wrap this up. Paul also loved the church. I think some, especially nowadays, man, the church, the church, local church gets a bad rap sometimes. And let me just say that a lot of us deserve it. There's some really sorry churches out there. Do you know that? There's some really sorry individuals that claim to be pastors that really aren't. Out there, not here, but out there. <laughs> I'm just, 
I gotta be really careful. Paul loved the church. Look at verse 22. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and then he went down to Antioch. Let me just pause. Here's just, this is just, just a question. When you read in the Bible and it says he went somewhere and he went up, which direction does your mind automatically think that is? North, south, east, or west? North, yeah, of course. Then when it says he went down, you're thinking that's obviously south because you, like me, have grown up in, the, in America, western hemisphere. We live by the GPS and the map, and that's how we think. That's not a Middle Eastern mindset, though. Up has nothing to do with north. In fact, if, you, if we were preaching in Australia today, there are a couple things. I'd have a better accent, and our maps would be upside down. I've seen those Australian maps where south is on the top. That just messes me up. I think it's interesting. But when it says that he went up, it doesn't mean he went up north. It means that he went up to the holy city, which even though it wasn't the highest elevation in the nation, is considered the holy hill. It doesn't say the name Jerusalem, but that's where he went. He went to Jerusalem, to the Jerusalem church, where James is the leader of the Jerusalem church. The apostles are there, the Christians are there. And he greeted the church and gave them updates on the mission work and all that was happening and thanked them for their support. And then it said he went down. It's interesting. So he goes up, which is actually a little bit southeast. And then it says he goes down, which is actually north, which really messes with our maps, right? But he goes down from the holy hill from Jerusalem to this city known as Antioch. And what's the big deal about Antioch? Antioch's where the church was that laid hands upon him and said, go, we are sending you as a missionary. Antioch is a local church in a local city. Paul was no rogue, independent, lone ranger missionary, just gathering support along the way. He was no Gnostic in disguise with some secret knowledge. Paul was a missionary sent and called by God, but, but sent by God's church with the hands of the brethren upon him, saying, go in our place as we pray for you and support you. Nothing has changed for mission work today. That's how it's to be. And Paul is making his way back to Antioch, to the church that sent him on mission. Here's the thing about the local church. The local church is God's plan for world evangelism. That needs to sink in. We somehow in our nation have turned the concept of the local church is is our plan for programmatic activities for our kids and our family members. But it is actually God's plan for world evangelism. The local church is God's strategy for personal discipleship. Let me just go ahead and, and anger a much of you right now and then I'll get it over with. Listen, personal discipleship is not optional, but most of us don't do it. I'm just, we don't do it. And can I just go ahead and declare that Sunday school is not designed to make disciples? You will not grow as a disciple in a Sunday school class. Most Sunday school classes in Baptist life, and I've been a Baptist Sunday school guy my entire life, and we can call them life groups, small groups, whatever you want. We tried small groups thinking we could co-opt the word and make you believe they're supposed to be smaller. It didn't work. So now we're calling them life groups, hoping you'd realize you're supposed to do life together, not sit in a room together. Discipleship does not take place in rows. Discipleship does not take place by a lecture. Discipleship will not take place when one person is presenting the word and only two or three are the loud people in the room that actually talk back. We will not stop doing life groups or Sunday school. There is a place for them. Those are open groups. It's a good place for people to plug in initially. But let me tell you this, folks. It's part of our strategy. We've put it out there. It's been ignored by most of our members. The discipleship group comes out of those Sunday school classes with a maximum of six to eight people committed one to another for a year of studying the Word of God without relying on an administrator to manage the curriculum. But we don't do it. We must do it, and now is the time. I think God has called us to make disciples. We're content on making disciples members. And we're, f- we're facing, we're facing the, the reality of what that, has, what that means now. Discipleship takes place when people know each other, when they care for each other, when they relate to each other, when they share with each other, when they're open with each other. And that rarely takes place even in a group of six to eight till about the sixth or eighth meeting. And all it takes is for someone to get real. And once one person gets real, all of a sudden everybody else takes their mask off and say, well, let's talk about this. You don't get that in Sunday school, most of the time. 
You might, you might be offended. Go, we do that in our class. Well, God bless you. You are a mutant because you're an anomaly, not the norm. So keep being mutated, I guess, but we need to make disciples. Paul loved the church. We must love the church because Christ loved the church so much he died for the church and for God's glory. And lastly, Paul loved where he lived. Where did Paul live? Oh, you look at this, he lived in a lot of places. But we read it really quickly and think he stayed two days here and four days there. Sometimes he stayed a year and a half. This is a long mission trip that he was on. This wasn't 12 days with a Travelocity uh, plan. This was a couple of years, if not more. Paul loved where he lived, and I know even though he was all over the place on these trips, in every city and every stop, he loved the place and the people. He loved the place because of the people. When we say we love where we live, that is not a license to go sit at home and never do anything. You know, years ago, we were facing this little acronym that came out, and it was kind of a joke, FOMO, F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. FOMO is why parents would sign their kids up for 45 travel teams and dance practice just in case their kids missed out on the fun and excitement of growing up. They burn out by the time they're 12, but nonetheless, FOMO. I want to make sure we don't miss anything. But now, within the church especially, we're, we're facing FOGO, F-O-G-O, the fear of getting out. I don't want to get out of my house. I don't want to do anything anymore. I'll let someone else do it. And I know there are stipulations and rules and guidelines, and they ought to be taken, and I'm not minimizing that, but the fear of getting out is the enemy's greatest attack, I think, on the church right now to hold us in tightly. When we live on mission, we realize that where we are living is where God has placed us for the moment. That that is a heavy statement, folks. When we live on mission, we realize that where we are living is where God has placed us for the moment. We got families here that are in the Navy. They're only here for a couple of years, but you're here for a couple of years. You're like, I don't love it right here. Well, this is the calling. Start loving where you live because God has you here intentionally and it's bigger than the U.S. Navy. One of the hardest things when I was a student pastor is when military families would move here and their children would have to change churches, especially in the middle of a youth group. And there is this false idea, and I, and, I, and I get it because I was that kid in a youth group, that if I go to a new church in a new city and I didn't get a vote as the kid, right? Dad got transferred or mom got transferred, and now we're moving from Memphis to Jacksonville or we're moving from Dayton, Ohio to Montgomery, Alabama or Texas to Mississippi, and they didn't ask the kids for a vote, but the, the kids like load up in the vehicles and they come and they had a great church experience. They had all their friends at their other church, their old youth group, their old youth director, their old youth pastor. And when they arrive at whatever church God has placed them in, there is this feeling, and I'm not blaming the kids, it's just real life, that if I like this new church and if I like this new youth group and if I like this new friend, then somehow in some weird way I'm betraying all of those that I left. So what will I do? I'm not going to like anybody. And I'll never love where I live. I hate the school. I hate my teacher. I hate the church. I hate my neighborhood because my friend group is back there. Now, it's easy to blame it on kids, but let me just say adults do the very same thing. The very same thing. We had a family come visiting our church. Oh, gosh, I only have negative 10 minutes. Listen. They wanted to join the church here, and we had our membership meeting, and, and they didn't join the church, so I'll go ahead and spoil the end. They didn't join. God love them. That's how I'll begin it. After, our, at we, after we had a meal and we talked about our vision, we talked about who we are, the individual began to tell us everything wrong with our, with our church. Now, I don't need anybody to tell me that. I mean, we start with bad preaching and we work our way down. I got it. But then they started telling us what we needed to do to make ourselves a good church because there's not a good church in Northeast Florida. This place is trash. That was like a quote. And I'm like, well, that's, that's encouraging. Thanks. I'll put you on the welcome wagon committee or whatever. They started describing a church in another metropolitan area that was a Baptist church, good church, but different than us, does things differently. And, and in fact, in the way it walked out, and until you do it that way, and you get that kind of choir robe, and you get this and that and the other, and the preacher preaches this way, and you got your own TV, you're nothing. And I said, and this is what I appreciate about Dave Paxson. He's not here now, but I appreciate Dave because I just went out in the parking lot, and I said, we're going home. I left Dave and Stanley. That's why they retired. I left them to talk to them. <laughs> <clears throat> and... And, and I don't know, I mean, I, you shouldn't be talking, Pastor, you shouldn't talk bad about people. Well, I am. So listen, <laughs> I walked away. I said, I, I don't know that I can handle this right now, um, but, but they walked away and, and, and in a loving, caring way. No joke. I'm not, that's not, I'm not making that up. They said, we think you'd be more happier at another church because we know you ain't going to be happy here. 
You gotta find the church where you love and the city that you love with the people that you love and you gotta love the people and that's a choice, by the way. Love where you live. If you love here but you long to be elsewhere, you don't love here. You know, if you just... Sometimes people are like, well, I can't wait till I retire so I can go back to X, Y, and Z, go to the mountains, go to the beach, go to this. That's great to have that, but that doesn't mean you can't love where you are in the meantime. And sometimes people live with a longing of where they used to be, and it doesn't exist anymore, but we live there in our mind. And we miss what's happening here. If you don't love where you live, you will miss the mission God has given you now. And loving where you live isn't about, I love the beach, or I love the the river, or I love the, 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 the architecture. It's about loving the people. Why did Paul love Antioch? It wasn't because Antioch was lovable, but because the Antiochians were. How could Paul love the most sinful city in the, in the world at the time, Corinth? Not because of their perverseness, but because of the brothers and sisters who had the same heavenly father that lived in Corinth. How could he love Ephesus? How could he love Rome where it didn't end well? because of the Roman Christians. If we're not careful, we will long for an imaginary and miss the mission of the now. It's a pretty simple message, and I believe the ministry is worth it. I do believe therapeutic deism is not going to fuel us. I don't think uh, religious cliches and feel-good mantras are enough. I don't actually think they're anything. Relying on our own strength, our own creativity, our own intuition, and pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps will leave us with our bootstraps pulled up and still failing daily because we will not be trusting in the one who offers all that we need. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, the true gospel of the good news, is what empowers us to love God, love all people, love the church, and love where we live because without the gospel, we're just settling for existing in a man-made story that doesn't matter. And we want to leave a legacy that outlasts us. This church is 100 years old. I pray I'm not the last pastor of it. But I also pray I don't live to be 300. But that when all of us are gone, that the next generations will be living for the Lord in Orange Park, changing the world that they'll be loving God and loving the people that will live here that don't live here now, that they will love where they live in ways that we can't fathom and that they will love this church, that they will serve for the sake of the gospel. If you're a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, then amen, and brother and sister, we're so glad that you are, and I'm glad I am. If God's revealing sin in your life, and you need to rededicate your life, confess your sin for using the word rededicate, and just repent. And let's get to work. But if you're not a believer, if you've never said yes to Christ, If you're trusting in being God's grandchild, meaning that your dad and mom are Christians and you hope that's enough, it's not. Let me just tell you, he has no grandkids. Then why don't you say yes today? You're here for a reason. You're online for a reason. Somehow, some way, the Holy Spirit has orchestrated it so that you could hear this message before you can't. Say yes to him today. We're going to close. I'll be down front. Online, you can email us. You can call us. You can connect with us. In the room, you can come see me, one of our other pastors, deacons, leaders, men or women in the church that would love to talk with you and pray with you, one of our deacons' wives, perhaps, staff wives. We don't want to leave a decision left undone. But thanks be to God, we're able to gather as we are. And may we honor him in how we respond. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for placing us where you've placed us for your glory and yours alone. And empower us to live for you fully, not trusting in temporal phrases and cliches, not seeking therapy, but truth. Bless us, I pray. May those decisions that must be made today be made today. In Jesus' name. Thank you, church.